All right, fellas. Well, hold on a minute. Now that the echo is gone, I'm still getting my digital camera set up for the streaming so I don't have to use up all my DV tapes. Uh, well, watch Kalen's uh, video response. It's pretty interesting. Made some very valid points. And yes, not everyone has a castle. I just so happen to have a castle nearby. But as I said in my first post about the zombie plan, uh, in the long run, a castle will not be extremely useful for a long-term infestation. You know, be a nice, safe point to rest for a while and reorganize and get his, you know, whoever we need to get to go with us. But in the long run, it won't, you know, be a permanent deal. If you've got a class three or higher, I believe, eh, you're not going to be able to pull it off. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. As Kaylin was saying, a lot of people just don't have the basics. So what I've got here, the zombie survival guide, you know, the Bible of all zombie hunters and survivalists. I'm going to be reading a couple of little summarized things out of this for you all. Now the first thing we're going to go over, the differences between the four, I do mean four, types of zombie infestations. Okay, so the first type of infestation that you need to know about is a class one infestation. Now this is usually a very small one and very easy to handle if you are prepared for it. You're only going to mess with maybe, oh, say, 1 to 20 zombies, you know, a small local family-owned graveyard, possible. Uh, usually this will take place in either a third world country or a small rural area of, you know, a major country. Second type of infestation is a class 2. Now this one is a little bit more extreme, ranging from maybe about 20 to 100 zombies in a more populated urban area like a small town or maybe a military base or, you know, a really huge mall. This one's a little bit more dangerous and you have to be very careful how to handle this one because uh, if you screw up on this one, uh, you really can be in a lot of serious danger. Now, the truly dangerous level that you start getting to is a class 3. Now these is where zombies number in the thousands over an area of several hundred miles. Now that is uh, when you have to start implementing your zombie plan to a great extent. hope you've got a lot of details worked out. And the single most dangerous class, a class 4. This is where the zombies outnumber us. We are not living in a human world anymore in a class 4. In a class 4, we are living in a zombie world. We are the borderline extinct race. We are now in danger. So, now that you're a little bit familiar with the different classes of zombie outbreaks, you need to learn which weapons are good for which situations. Now, rule number one with zombies is you don't want to get anywhere near them. But, let's say, you know, the zombie manages to sneak up on you somehow. What kind of weapons would be the best ones to use? Now, like I've said, the machete, you can't go wrong with this. The machete is a very useful tool. It's solid, it's lightweight, and it can cut through a zombie's head very easily. Preferably decapitation. Now, the thing is, you need to be able to use a machete. So I would recommend uh, going out into just like some random wooded area and start just hacking down some trees with it. You need to also take care of your machete. You need to make sure that you keep it sharpened, and if it eventually does wear down from the training, get yourself a new one. Make sure it's durable and make sure it's a military grade machete. Uh, also, when going to get a machete, Make sure it's not one of those showy kind of ones that you would buy at a flea market for $5 because those things, while they might claim to be military grade, usually are just display items that are made out of very cheap steel or very cheap metals, and they actually will break very easily. But, 
Also, on another note, you always want to make sure to develop one key weapon that you will always need throughout the entire outbreak yourself. You need to be in shape. You need to be able to run long distances. You need to be able to survive. If you weigh 300 pounds and can't run 15 feet without, you know, having a hack and cough, my friend, you're zombie food. Alright, so moving on. Here is a little weapon that you probably have not heard of very often. This is called a Shaolin Spade. Now you see that picture of it right there? This is a pretty useful weapon from what I've read in the book. Uh, it has curved ends, sharp ends. Uh, you can basically use it to decapitate a zombie in one swift poking motion. Chainsaws, power tools, um, they are powerful, but they tend to run out of power via gasoline or via electricity, and you end up having to refill or recharge them somehow, so they're really just more of the, oh crap, zombie on top of me, grab the randomest thing around me kind of weapon. Not really a good taking along on a 10 mile hike kind of weapon. Now. In the subject of slings and arrows, uh, slingshots, blowguns, shrunkens, throwing knives, compound or longbows. While these all seem good in theory because you keep a distance, unless you've got a lot of training in them, uh, yeah, you're probably not going to be able to do much. And even if you have a lot of training in them, they're not very practical. You run out of arrows, you run out of blow darts, you run out of bolts for your crossbow. Um, the sling, you know, David and Goliath, possible because there are rocks lying around, but you'd have to be very, very good with it and still only a 1 in 10 shot of actually hitting the zombie. Plus, really all you're doing is popping it upside the head and just getting its attention. I mean, you'd, be able, you'd have to have some serious power behind that throw and doubtful that it'll be able to take a zombie down in one blow. About the only useful thing, I think, an arrow throwing device would be for is if you set it on fire and you were wanting to set fire to them from a distance, which, like Kaylin was saying, flaming zombies near you is never a good thing. But in this situation, I guess flaming zombies far enough away from you can be a good thing. Now, firearms. Uh, Submachine gun, heavy machine gun, assault rifle, these are all good in theory, but you want to have something that's easy to fix, easy to reload. Automatic weapons tend to, well, lock up on you a lot. Uh, the simple handgun where you just pop the bullets out after you're done is slower to reload, but far more reliable. It's a revolver. Yeah, I'm not a real gun nut, so I couldn't place the name for that there. Accessories, silencers. If at all possible, put a silencer on your gun. Uh, a gunshot may be able to take out the one zombie in front of you, but all of a sudden here come 20 more because they heard the gunshot. Telescopic sight can be very useful, especially if you're going to go for the whole sniper in the bushes kind of thing. That actually could work very well combined with a silencer, and you can pick off most of the zombies in the area, though not recommended if it's large groups. On the subject of fire, uh, it's really not useful unless you've got some distance, and you've got to be very careful where you use it at. I mean, setting a zombie on fire, even from a distance, if it catches fire to nearby buildings in an urban environment, you could set the whole city on fire by accident. Uh, learn the lesson of the London incident, where the whole, you know, frickin' city almost burned down. Um, it's not really going to be useful if you're trying to get rid of them right then. I mean, they don't feel pain, and you're going to have to let it uh, melt through their flesh. And according to this, it takes a very long time for flesh to burn. So, I wouldn't recommend fire. Now, chemical warfare. Uh, most things that you're going to use chemically are not going to affect zombies. You can't poison them. 
you can't use a whole lot of biological warfare. Acid theoretically could work, though it'd have to be some really strong acid, and it would still not get them immediately. Last thing you want is a zombie covered in acid hugging you in its death throes. Here's a little thought that most people don't think of. Have you ever seen zombies in a zoo full of animals that have escaped? No. See, a lot of creatures like uh, flies, vultures, and other animals like that feed on dead bodies. So, if you can just manage to lure the zombies into an area full of those type of animals, you theoretically could kill them without ever having to touch them. The animals would take them out. Uh, now, the zombies would probably still attack the animals, but I mean, if it's you or Fido, I choose myself, personally. Now, electricity. This is a little tricky. Uh, electricity does not seem to do long-term damage, but because a zombie still is a creature powered by electrical impulses, it can stun them. It can actually, you know, put them down for a little bit. Though, I don't think in the long run it really does much other than that. Uh, it basically can paralyze them. Uh, one way you could use electricity is to have like a moat or maybe just a, a barrier of water like a river or something and find a way to electrify it because I mean then if a zombie would walk into the water he'd be paralyzed more or less and stuck underwater and then you wouldn't have to mess with him. Uh, radiation experiments have been done uh, they're trying out things but at this point uh, not enough of us have access to plutonium or anything I mean, short of nuking them, I don't see how that's really going to work. And for all we know, we could end up with radioactive zombies. The last thing we need is uh, zombies, you know, with the ability to shoot eye beams Or, you know, fly. Uh, that, that, I don't even want to think about that. Now we move on to armor. Now, I know that I was the first person to come up with this idea. You see, I've been wearing this the whole time. A leather jacket. Leather, leather jackets, leather chaps, leather boots, leather gloves, uh, just leather period. It's lightweight, durable, it is the absolute best armor you can use. Now that I'm done talking about the uh, leather jacket, I took it off, it's kind of hot in here tonight. Alright, moving on to the next types of armor. Uh, you want to make sure and wear a helmet. Halen showed us that, you know, you can't be picky about your helmets, but, you know, it if you happen to have any military surplus or biker shops or anything like that around, I mean even Walmart possibly, though I'd stay away from Walmart, really big area, probably lots of zombies in there. But just try and raid somewhere and get a decent helmet if you can, uh, if you don't happen to have one lying around. Now, armor to stay away from. Do not wear plate mail. I know you want to do that whole, you know, Sir Lancelot, King Arthur thing. But, uh, what happens when the zombies can't get through, but then you can't move because you're surrounded by zombies? You're going to either suffocate to death, or just die of uh, being stuck in the bunch of a, a bunch of zombies for a really long time. I mean, the likelihood of you not freaking out and trying to rip the plate mail off is pretty low, but if someone managed to stay sane through that situation, eventually they'd die because zombies were all around them. You'd suffocate or dehydrate or some strange thing. Alright, another bit of armor uh, that is actually really awesome, the shark suit. But the reason I don't think the shark suit is the ultimate armor is because uh, I, I, I've never really seen any shark suits around here. I mean, unless you're on the coast or near a major body of water, uh, I have never actually seen a shark suit. I didn't even know they existed until I started reading up about this stuff. Um, the shark suit's more durable than leather and more flexible. Uh, those people on the coasts, by all means, go for the shark suit. It's built to, you know, not be bitten through by sharks. If a shark can't bite through it, nothing can. Uh, Kevlar, eh, like the shark suit, harder to get a hold of, go leather. Uh, if you can't get any leather and any shark suits or anything else, tight clothing. You want to have uh, jeans. Uh, you at least want to cover all your limbs. I mean, cover as much as possible. Uh, 
just don't like be walking around, you know, with like this with your arms all bare, because then all it takes is you know waving your arm back and a zombie clamping onto it, and next thing you know you're bitten and infected. Also, short hair, women, chop it off, bald preferably. But you know if you're in an Arctic environment, then you know you want to at least keep a little hair. Now we get to preparation of your home. Uh, Depending on your class of infestation, if you're a class one, you could barricade yourself in your home and wait it out until help arrived, more than likely, um, if you have the supplies to do that. Now, if you're, I, I personally think, some people think you can survive a class two in the same situation. I personally vote uh, get on the move, uh, don't barricade your home. Uh, I've heard some really, really interesting stories about how people would barricade their home. I personally live on the second floor and all it'd take me doing is knocking out the stairs because they're built outside out of wood. So all I'd have to do is loosen some nails and take an axe to it and I'd be stuck on the second floor away from them. Lucky me! Castles and second floor. Uh, preparations, uh, prepare at your leisure I guess. I mean get what you can, get what you think is necessary. Food, water, uh, assume everything that you're used to is going to be torn out from under you. Uh, rations, por press, preferably the portable rations, you know, like the ones that the military uses and those little silver packages that they don't taste good, they taste like little crackers for some reason, I don't know. Now we get to what do you do in the event of a class three? Uh, well, according to the zombie survival guide, a fortress is needed. I just so happen to have a castle nearby. Now, you know, I don't think that castle will be able to hold up as well as some of the other things that it talks about. And it, I don't think it exactly took into account that people might have castles nearby. Uh, military complexes are very good to use. Prisons are very ideal because they're designed to keep people in. So theoretically, they can also keep people out. One of the most awesome things is offshore oil rigs. But with offshore oil rigs, you run the risk of you know running out of supplies. Uh, on a side note, me and a friend have had a conversation about this. If it could be managed, Alcatraz. I mean, isolated. Uh, if you set up a, some sort of system to siphon off rainwater, you got plenty of water. Uh, it's got land in there, so I mean you could garden things. I mean you could be completely shut off. The walls are high. And you just wouldn't have to worry about zombies. It's out in the middle of a frickin' bay, at a good distance away from the coast. But let's say you're on the run. Uh, first thing you need to do, figure out where you're going. You need to make sure and gather intelligence and plan your journey. Don't go to Las Vegas just because your sister lives there and she's a you know ex-marine. Uh, first, make sure that she's still there and that her ex-marine skills actually helped her get out of the situation if it happens to happen there. You need to make sure and keep in shape when you're on the run. Avoid large groups. Train your group. Uh, remain mobile. Uh, sadly, it's survival of the fittest at this point, so if really and truly, uh, if there's weak members of your group to truly survive, you're going to have to abandon people. And other than speed, uh, your closest ally is going to be stealth. Quiet at all times. You know, avoid areas even if you have to go miles around out of your way on your path. Pay attention to your surroundings uh, and most importantly, I know it seems hard, but you need to get good sleep. Uh, you're wondering how the hell do I sleep with zombies everywhere? Well, climb a tree! A really, really big tree and uh, get used to sleeping in trees. Uh, take something along to strap yourself into the tree. I don't know, a hammock, you know, something like that. And pray to God that you don't fall out of the hammock in the middle of the night. Oh, and if you snore, uh, I feel so sorry for you. Avoid urban areas at all costs. If you don't know this, just turn off this video right now because you're screwed in. Uh, you want to take portable equipment. Essentially, think as if you were going surviving out in the middle of, uh, like, the mountains or something. Completely isolated. If you take that kind of stuff with you, you're probably going to be alright. Uh, think Marie. That's the best way to go on this. Vehicles, uh, I know that 
a lot of people have said, you know, SUVs, big trucks, stuff like that. Uh, you don't want to take a car like that. I mean, those are good for cross-country kind of things, but in an urban environment, you're going to have to ditch it. Uh, plus, in an urban environment, you know, that roar of that engine is going to lure them just like the gunshot. Uh, strange to say, but being on foot and a bike is preferable. If you have to have a gas-powered vehicle, a motorcycle at most. I know that you're thinking, well, they'll yank me off the motorcycle or the bike, but if they don't know you're there because you're whizzing by on a mountain bike, then even better. Now, I know what you're thinking. Okay, so we're on the move. Where are we going? Mountainous areas. Places that are not normally inhabitable by living creatures. You know, the Arctic. Uh, stay away from the desert. That's just as bad as being surrounded by zombies, you know, dehydration. If you do have to move around in the desert, uh, preferable to the three hours before dusk and three hours after dawn is when you move. Rest at night and keep yourself in a shaded stationary position in between the, those parts of the day. Uh, not really recommendable to be in the desert. Now, the Arctic is actually a very good place to avoid zombies. I mean, the temperature drops at night and freezes zombies because they don't really have body heat. And uh, during the day, I mean, you're on pretty even visual distance with them. I could put a zombie out, you know, from a good distance away against that white backdrop of snow. Also, one of the really nice things is you actually get to sleep at night instead of having to move around. The longer days and longer nights really pay off up there. That does seem to be just about everything, uh, other than some true stories and some strategies on how to fight zombies, you know, when it comes to, like, mass warfare. But for your average individual, I hope this guide informs you a little. If you ever run into these situations, um, you may not even have access to this guide, so memorize it now.